Um, now we'll, let's talk about Blender Proc. Um, this is a really one of the, the projects which is really dear to my heart. I've been working on this for a while now, one and a half years with my team, of course. I've, this is not something I did by myself because it's by now far too big and it has too many users. Um, the whole idea behind it was I needed something to generate realistic looking images for the approach you just heard about. And to get there, um, we used Blender as a base and we tried to procedurally generate images for deep learning. And this can be used in such a variety of instances. This could be used for semantic segmentation. We've used it for that. Uh, 60 pose annotation, so finding out the 60 pose of an object. Uh, normal estimation, we use that for that. Model depth estimation, you could do this for this. And uh, we even have a stereo mode where you get two color images and such things. So there's such a big variety of problems which can be solved by generating data for it. Why is that even necessary? Why do we need simulation? To be honest, real data collection is time consuming. And I don't mean like, oh, this takes a few days, this takes ages. If you need a lot of data, you spend ages collecting it. If we look here at the NYU data set, I have some images from it right there. Um, so NYU is about semantic segmentation, where you try to um, assign to each pixel in the color image um, a class label. Here, these classes are colored in different um, colors. And you see here, chairs have one color and the wall has one color and so on. Doing this takes a lot of time. If you, do, if you need four to five minutes per image, you're quite fast. And now imagine you need 50,000 images. If you just have one person and you spend five minutes, this is around eight hours working day, you spend around 500 days on this. This is a long time. Even if you uh, employ someone to do this, then it gets expensive because you have to hire someone who works one and a half years on a job, which is really dull. Labeling data, if you have ever talked to someone who did this a lot, they're not happy. <laughs> it's just not something which makes you happy time on time because it's so, it's so dull and repetitive. And we can spend our time more exciting, hopefully, I think. Furthermore, it is often incorrect. Um, so if you look down here uh, on below this chair, the floor is missing or it was not labeled. Why? Um, because humans, Sometimes I'm like, okay, this should be enough. Now I got the great details here in the background. Eh, I missed this one part of the chair, but it should be enough now. I'm done. And they, that also means it's inconsistent. You don't have a perfect line uh, color image to a semantic segmentation. And this is not just true for semantic segmentation. This might be also true for uh, 60 post estimation. You know how hard it is to precisely get the 60 pose of an object relatively to a camera. We would need some tracking system around it and then maybe some April text and then estimate the pose in all the camera frames and then combine information to be sure that this is the correct pose. Again, time consuming, expensive, hopefully not incorrect. This one is probably not so inconsistent as the semantic labeling where it is about human judgment. Something which is really interesting and inconsistent is also in NYU, there are a lot of bats because it's indoors and humans always have a bat in their space. Um, on the bats, they often have pillows and there is a subclass for pillows, but not all pillows and the bats are part of the pillow class. Sometimes this pillow belongs to the bat as well. There's no blanket class. So blankets are always part of the bat, pillows are not. And this confusion later on during training just confuses your network. It's like me telling you, oh, Blender Proc is great for generating data. And then I tell you Blender Proc is actually about uh, milking a cow. This conflicting data will not help you in deciphering what this is actually about. And so consistency in data generation for deep learning is really, really crucial. So because of all these reasons, we choose to do simulation instead of real data. And what people have done, we're not the first people to do simulation, of course, this is done for ages now, but they have used a lot of OpenGL. And by OpenGL, I mean all the simple renderers. Every time we just load your objects, throw them in a scene and render them really quickly. Great advantage, it's quick, but it is not realistic. At least 
the most human can immediately tell this is not a real image. They look at it and they're like, there is something missing. The interaction between the certain objects that's missing kind of looks like the bat is floating above the floor and there's no reflections. It just looks dull. Um, of course, now you could say, oh, why don't you just use a game engine? Um, there are a lot of people using game engines to generate color images. My problem with game engines is game engines were designed to fool the human eye. So an example of this is um, the human eye is really good or the complete human vision system is really good in deciphering if a tree grew naturally, if the branching in the tree was organic. We can immediately take, even if the textures are perfect and every detail was meticulously designed, we can immediately tell something is off with that tree. We can't tell why, but we can say this is not real. Um, in contrast, if we see a metallic surface like a spoon and the reflection in the spoon is incorrect, we would never know. Just imagine the reflection, if you hold a spoon in front of yourself right now, how would it look? It's nearly impossible for us. We can't predict it. Our vision system just fails. It's such kind of easy tasks. And because game engineers know such stuff, they exploit these facts heavily. They focus the attention of the things we can distinguish and neglect all the other stuff. The problem now is that you generate data which has these internal biases. This might not be a problem, but it could be a problem down the line when you actually use this system then on real data. For that reason, we believe Blender in that regard performs better because it uses a light tracer and actually produces more realistic scenes than uh, with a game engine. So if we now do this on this scene, for this where we just saw this boring up GL scene, it looks like this. And this is so much more realistic. These are the same objects. There's no change. The only thing is we change the renderer and touched a bit on the materials maybe. But overall, it's nearly the same. And as you see now, because there is this shadow between the bat and the foot, it looks so much more realistic. The objects have an interaction between each other. This lamp here in the background generates um, a light circle around it on the wall behind it. And these interactions are really crucial. Of course, it doesn't, it's not perfect. If you look here at a submover, uh, the model of the submover was basic to begin with. It's not perfect after using a better renderer. But it is a start. The image looks already much better. And now the best part about simulation is that we just don't have this one image. We also have the normals. We have depth. We can do semantic segmentation. And this semantic segmentation is now pixel accurate. So we have the exact boundaries where our bad ends. And uh, doing this by hand is tedious, even if you use some shell segmentation beforehand and then try to assign each shell, it's done always still tedious. This is so much more easy. And then you can even do some exciting things where you just render a whole video in your simulation. All of this is completely simulated and it looks quite realistic, doesn't it? And from there, um, we can do even more. So um, here we have some objects. These objects are probably well known to all the people who do 60 pulse estimation. Um, I should now mention um, the Blender Brock renderer was used in the ECCV Bob challenge. The Bob challenge is one of the biggest challenges in 60 pulse estimation. We try to estimate your pose in space, translation and rotation. And we were the official renderer. We'll cover on the results a bit later on. As you can see now, we've thrown them here completely on this table. And in the background, you can already see a part of Justin. So that we can generate all of this um, as realistic as possible. Of course, some of these objects don't look perfect, but that is because the data we used to generate them were just not perfect. This is part of the data sets and they just look like this. So if your models are not good enough, then your resulting images will, of course, not be perfect. Matthias is asking a question. Um, yeah. Any plans of incorporating the recent real-time ray tracing capabilities of GPUs in any way? Um, so as this, is, uh, as this whole approach is based on Blender, we're 
profiting from all of their uh, successes, successes because Blender is working on this for decades now. How do I get realistic light um, tracing in a scene? Uh, to have developed cycles in close relationship now with NVIDIA, there is something called Optics, um, which is an add-on uh, available on modern uh, NVIDIA graphic cards, which speeds up the process by a big margin. Then it's probably five times faster. Then you can use AI denoising to denoise the images in the end, because why we need them, I will cover on later on. But um, with that, you can make it much, much quicker. Uh, for example, the new consumer graphic cards from NVIDIA, which were just released a couple of weeks ago, they are twice as fast as, uh, as the previous generation in generating these images. And I assume in a couple of years, we will be on a real-time performance on this ray tracing without any tricks. And this is something which um, Blender and other uh, platforms like this made possible. They researched this and we're just building up on this. So we're using their great experience there and their advances they made over the last decade. So um, I hope that answered the question. Um, when we talk about simulation, we always have to talk about the sim to real gap. How do I close the simulation to real gap? Because our simulation simulated images won't be perfect. They won't look like real images. People, when they pay enough attention, will always like, this is off, something is off. I can't say what, it's usually the dirt because simulated scenes always lack dirt and human scenes are always full of dirt. So that's the difference. If you can't tell if it's real, look for the dirt. What we need to do is make the, the simulation domain so big that by chance, the reality domain is encapsulated. So deep networks are really good in interpolating between data points. And if by chance your simulation domain is bigger than the reality, then your data points, which represents reality, are just, uh, just needed to be interpolated between two simulation points. And that should be the goal. Mostly it is that some part of the reality is still escaping our simulation, but we will get there. Things which can help you to increase your simulation domain are randomization. So we can, for example, use here light randomization, where we change the light position and the light color randomly. We can also change material, material properties. So here, currently all of the objects are kind of flat looking. We can make them nearly mirror-like. So we can change the textures. We can even move new textures on the objects to remove a texture bias. CNNs are well known for having a texture bias. This means they will focus much more on the texture of an object than on the shape. It is, um, Bio biologists argue that human vision works the other way around. We are more concerned about the shape of an object than the actual texture. CNNs are in that regard flipped, which is another reason to not work with um, game engines because if there's already such a strong contrast between the two of them, maybe it's not that wise relying on things which were built on knowing human drawbacks. So we can now randomize such properties to make it easier that the network learns all kinds of variations so it can interpolate that it can reach reality. How many properties were you randomizing? How many? Yeah. Uh, in this one, so first we uh, had just light position and light color, and then we uh, randomized roughness, specularity, and metallic. Metallic is a property to make it more metallic looking. What exactly that means, I'd refer to the Blender documentation. There are a bit more detail there. Because one of the intuitions that I've developed is that it's the, the number of different properties which are randomized has a, a big impact on essentially the, stable, the stability of the baseline in the, the sort of synthetic image manifold, which is what I think drives generalization. But that's just my kind of gut intuition. No, you're absolutely right. The more, the better. Yeah. Um, I'm going to cover Cozy Pose later on a bit. Um, Cozy Pose is one of the winners of the last Bob challenge. They also used Blender proc data, but they even used the data and then did crazy augmentations on them. And by crazy, I mean like augmentations where we humans would be like, is this even still the same image? I'm um, like really crazy, completely pulled up the contrast, removed um, color saturation, crazy, complete color changes and stuff where uh, it's not real anymore, but it increases the simulation domain so that maybe the reality is enclosed. This is always the goal. How do I make my domain so big that reality is in there? 
it's not about creating super realistic images. It's more about creating them so in such a variety that it still uh, encapsulated um, the reality. Yeah, exactly. And I always feel that your sort of the neural network is just a whole bunch of levers in really high dimensional space. So yes. you're just trying to provide as broad a baseline in yes. as many different dimensions as possible, so that you reduce like, the amount of um, extrapolation that you have to do. Exactly, and with Bender Pro, it's like three lines of config file you add and everything works magically. Isn't that great? That was the goal behind us because we need this every day. So we did it. And at some point we realized um, we could share this with the world. So that not only we profited from it because if more people contribute, this is gonna get bigger and it helps us too if it, other people contribute. And so far people already did, which makes me really, really happy. <laughs> yeah, we can see, we can see in your face. Yeah, you know, this is something I really burn for because I feel like um, we have a lot of models now. People have generated models without no end in the last decade, um, but they have not come up with sufficient methods to generate the data. We actually need to train them. Um, and if you're a researcher at German Institute, you're bound at German laws, you cannot just pull millions of images by I don't know, Facebook and use them for your training, you actually have to find a way to generate them. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've thought about how do we get this and it has the advantages. It is just consistent and usually perfect in the regard that the matching is correct, which is often not the case in real data, sadly. Absolutely, and, and if you're trying to write a safety case, you also want to tie the performance of your system back to real world physical properties, which if you're trying to do it with real data is just a nightmare. Absolutely. Anyway, we'll talk about this afterwards. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. A, co a comment about this, one second. Um, when you said you want to broaden the simulation space as much as possible. Yes. So when you broaden the space of simulation, the space for training, this is a lot of training time and effort and everything uh, goes with it. So on top of that, I think a discriminator of training process where you can filter out those images that really look like real life. Is this something doable in like a, such a big space? Is this something that is uh, um, prop There are methods which where you back propagate through your um, renderer. This was really popular in the last nine months, I would say, where people <laughs> invented, yeah, deep learning is moving fast. So yeah. um, where they invented um, visualizers where you can back propagate through. That has the great advantage that you can actively change properties of materials to manipulate certain things. Problem is, um, these are usually you, um, based on rasterizers in contrast to ray tracers. And rasterizers is anything which is more OpenGL or game engine like mm -hmm. in contrast to a ray tracer. Mm -hmm. I've not seen uh, an approach, uh, that's not true. There's one approach where they also use a ray tracer, but the back propagation capabilities are kind of limited. But is, ray tracing with back propagation is super hard. Ray tracing on its own is hard, but with back propagation, I think we need a few more years of research and someone who's really dedicated in that field to do that. Okay, but so I've talked a lot about how great Blender Proc is. Let's see how it actually works. How do you get something to work here? So um, we start with our pipeline. Um, the pipeline is the whole idea behind us. And the pipeline itself consists out of several modules. And all of these modules are executed after each other. So we have modules, um, for initialization and um, for changing the world state, like loading an object, changing the material properties of that object, placing a camera somewhere, placing a light and such things. And this world state is the Blender internal state. So we have basically written an API on top of the API to make it easy to do these randomizations quickly without great time every time reading the Blender documentation which is a bit tedious because it's quite big. So each of these modules then has an init function and a run method. Init is usually to initialize some things which are later used in the run. The run actually does something like loading an object, rendering the scene. And the nice thing, each module now has access to our config. And this config, which I show in a bit, the config contains all the information necessary to construct the module and to make it work. Uh, examples of modules would be RGB renderer, which cons constructs our color images, which are used in on the paper we've seen earlier in this talk. Then the SunZG loader, which loads the SunZG scene without doubt. You wouldn't see anything, just a gray screen. 
than a camera sampler to get realistic camera poses. We have a lot of constraints already built in that. Like for example, it can check if it's too close to a certain object or any object so that such camera poses are rejected. It can check if there are enough interesting objects in on the camera frustum right now. That means that for example, the distribution of categories in the image is high enough so that, that, is, that the camera doesn't look at the wall. Wall images are interesting, but if you sample randomly in indoor scenes, a lot of images are just boring. And it's more human-like to look at the things where actually stuff happens, like, oh, there's a couch and there's certain things, then just meter to the left or just there's wall. And then we have a light sampler to make it a bit more random in that regard. So let's look at certain modules here. For example, we have an RGB renderer, which is built on the internal ray tracer I mentioned earlier. And to use it, we have a YAML config file, um, which I covered later on, just a tiny bit here, uh, foreshadowing for the RGB renderer. You would just say, oh, please now use this module, which is called RGB renderer. It's in the folder renderer. And you can hand over some config value. In this instance, I would set the samples account. So samples is the amount of um, rays which are thrown in the scene and calculated. More samples reduce the noise in uh, areas where there's a lot of shadow. Um, for example, here under, under the bed, or um, there's not that much shadow here in these scenes, but under the bed, if you don't have enough samples, um, the noise there would be um, a bit thrown off. Nice thing here, noise in dark areas is something normal um, color sensors have to this problem. So if you're in a really dark room, you already notice that sometimes there's just noise in your color images. So it's similar to that, even though the noise patterns are not the same. I have to warn you, achieving such no noise patterns, which are similar to real sensors is not that easy, at least in Blender on its own. Of course, there are methods to do this if you want to. Um, a nice thing now is, I mentioned earlier, there's now optics and this AI denoiser, which now means we could render these scenes with probably 30 to 40 samples instead of 20, 255. So we can slash this number down even further. In combination with the improved speed we get from the new graphic cards coming up every few years, uh, this should be doable in real time, I hope, in a few years. Let's see how it goes, especially with the focus of uh, NVIDIA now in it and AMD here too, where they focus more on this real-time ray tracing because it's interesting for games. Every time something is interesting for games, it's helpful for us as researchers too. So then there are samplers. We have a variety of samplers for light, camera poses. We can sample in variety of shapes, like inside of a box, uniform 3D sampling, on a shell, on a circle, uh, inside, of a part of a shell and stuff, such things. You can then combine them that you first sample in a box and then you add a shell sampling to get a position in space and then around the space you sample on a shell and such things. So we have provided a lot of possibilities to randomize this whole thing. And for here, we then can of course set a location. We will see this later on in an example where we just specify a provider. Providers in our, um, Blender proc pipeline are always things which return something. So in this instance, it returns a vector, a three-dimensional vector, which is sampled between this min and max value uniformly. And of course, this can also be a shell uh, sampler or a Gaussian distribution or something like that, and whatever parameters are then necessary there. Oh, one thing maybe I should mention here is whenever you are unsure which parameters you sh can use, check the header of this certain class. We are working on a website which can pull out these informations, but right now, um, for example, the class uniform 3D sampler would have a list of all possible configs explained in detail and the type it expects. And usually also the default value if you don't provide one. Then we have lastly our writers. Um, we support different data sets, for example, cocoa annotations, if you want to do bounding boxes, or most of our stuff is saved in HDF5 containers. Um, they're used in the scientific world, maybe you've heard them before. Um, the nice thing, they work like dictionaries. So you have your key and your data block, and you can store your color image, your normal image, and so on, your camera pose, maybe the poses of objects, all in one container for this one camera pose. 
And um, this has the advantage that you don't lose stuff and it's all compressed. So you get all of the stuff. Um, this is looseless compression, so it will be a bit bigger than if you use JPEG compression or something else. And again, um, it would be just a small line of code, just write module and then you will see this later on in the example where we dive in the first basic example. So how do I get started? What if I want to really use Blender Proc? So first, um, you have to git clone the project. Um, just type in this Gerard and for the installation, installation, this is already it. That was it. That's how easy it is. Um, the only thing then you have to do is run it. And you can just run. You don't need to install Blender, by the way. Um, you can just run the example. So in this instance, you would just type in Python run example basic config. And then it will probably tell you that you need to install PyYaml. And that's the only dependency we currently have. But we assume a lot of people already have that. So you would need to install that if you don't have it by now. What happens then is that it tells you, oh, you missed some uh, arguments. Um, these config files, which I'll cover in a second, can be overloaded with arguments from the command line, which is quite useful. So here we have, it tells us, oh, you're missing three arguments. The first one is used in the modules camera loader, and it's a path. So it's probably the path to a camera file where the camera poses are specified. The second one is from the object loader, which loads objects into the scene. So probably some object file, which we have to add. And then finally, um, it will ask us what the global output here is. So where should I save all the files I'm gonna generate in this run? And if you type that in, if you add these arguments, it will automatically download Blender in the correct version, put it somewhere, and then it will pip install inside of the Blender Python distribution, the correct pet catches it needs. Um, so what happens is you still have your own Python distribution, but that one just starts a new Python distribution and calls Blender with that. Blender has its own Python distribution where we install some packages which are needed. You can add your own, but I'm not gonna cover that today. Check out our examples. I will cover uh, now our basic example here. This is the basic config file, all you need for that. We have currently 34 different examples where there's a um, detailed description how do you do certain things? This is the one where you, most people should start with. It goes over the basics and how everything works. But there are more detailed examples. How do I use ShapeNet? How do I use SunCG and so on? How do I use TLS, different data sets? Or how do I do camera sampling? And we provide examples which take you by your hand and guide you through it. And if you still have a question, just raise an issue. We usually answer in under an hour with a detailed explanation of what you could do. So let's dive in at this uh, explanation. So um, we start with this modules. You, we see here you have a list of modules which are executed after each, each other. And you start with the main initializer. That one just initializes the scene, deletes any objects with, which might be there. If you start a blender, it starts with a random um, cube. This one gets, for example, deleted and stuff like that. So um, it sets up the stage for everything which comes after. And you can set some global variables here over this global scope here, which are then available in all modules later on. This is quite useful to want to write output here in several writers you might use. And then what we do after that is we load an object. So we write here, load an object, just use this module, load object loader, and then we specify over the config, over this path, this arguments. Again, if you lost, what was the right word here for how do I specify this path? You can always check in the um, header file of these object loaders and read up. There's a documentation for each value which you could use. Some are more complex, like the camera sample has like, I think 30 to 40 config values which you could use because the uh, varieties that are so big. Then we want to create a light here in our scene. Um, we specify here with the light loader, we say it's of type point, we specify the location and the energy value. Quite straightforward. Then let's look at the rest of this. So um, we need a camera to actually render it. Um, here we say, I'll load our camera data from this file. And in this file, the, form, uh, the file format is, first there are three values for location, and then there are three rotation values. Um, 
and each line then would contain a new camera post to render. Of course, you can specify your own file format here, or you sample them here with a provider, which, we've, uh, which we will see later. Then um, we use an RGB renderer. We see this is a bit more complex than the one I showed you earlier. We can specify now, sorry, also the amount of um, the keys we want to use, like colors, normals, and distance for color, the normals, and the distance. Distance is in contrast to depth, not the same. Depth is already projected into the camera frame. So we, we provide that too, but that is something we do in the post-processing step in the end. So we can render distance and render normals just by setting here the true value. This does not gen, uh, create any overhead because this can be done while generating the color images. And Blender, we found a way to extract that information while this actually happens in Blender and offer it directly. Some renderers like, for example, optical flow, they have to be run in a separate step. So that will be a small overhead, but for that you get optical flow or semantic segmentation. And in the end, we use our HCF5 writer and we use here post-processing module to remove redundant channels. All outputs saved by Blender always have three channels. This is sadly not changeable. But what we can do is we can remove the redundant channels in the distance channel because it's then just three times the same. So we can remove them to save a bit of disk space. So that's already it. If we throw that um, with the arguments we saw here at uh, in our command line, it would render the scene and then we could look at the resulting HDF5 files, which should look like this. So we have two camera poses in this camera pose file and we will generate, generate a cam, uh, color image, normal and a depth image for two camera poses. Um, that's already it. That's how you start with Blender Proc. Any questions so far? Yes, there is a question in the chat if, by your guess. By the way, I guess if you can, if you can speak, so feel free. Otherwise, I'll just read your question. Yeah, please interrupt me at any point. So he's asking, um, is it possible to create a scene in Blender first and then use the data, objects, camera positions, etc., as input to the config files, changing the existing data to new one and then running the run py file? Um, we don't have a safer yet, but we have a loader. Um, that should be a good option. I will put that on the uh, feature request list. Um, see, there are always new things we can add to this, even though we already have a bunch of stuff in it. Um, what we could do is use the blend loader. It loads blend files. This is the internal Blender data representation file. And from that, you can load objects, cameras, lights, whatever you want, even materials. And then you can use them in your scene later on. We use that, for example, if we really have high complex models, um, uh, in an internal data set, we represented teddy bears, which have simulated hair on them. And we save them as blend files because saving them in any other kind of format would be a hassle. So for those we use, for example, this blend loader. Does this answer your question? Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, so my question was exactly, let's say uh, I create a new object in Blender. Mm -hmm. uh, robotic arm and uh, so I want to take photos of it and from different angles and different cameras so I tried using this blender prop but uh, I added some of my uh, seeing the camera positions in it I was unable to uh, think how should I put my own camera positions here so how should I generate the data on my own so perfect um, you know what this is going to be covered in four slides how do you place your camera and how do you look at something okay okay yeah sure if you didn't fully get it by then, you can ask that question again, okay? Yeah. Any other question? Also, I'm just gonna, oops, I'm just gonna move on to the next. No? So to the basics so far? There was a, there was a comment by William. Um, I'm, I'll read it out. Um, yeah, do that. A Bayer sensor simulation does improve performance, Bayer fil filter even. So I am personally not familiar with a Bayer filter, so. Um, if I remember correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, a Bayer filter is um, the, the simulation of, or not the simulation, um, the structure how color sensors in cameras work, or most cameras at least. They have two greens and one yeah. blue and red. Is that yeah. correct? Something like that. So they've got a, a sort of, it depends on the camera manufacturer, but you've got a, a pattern of colored tiles mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that obviously different frequencies of light through, which gives you 
RGB. And there's, there's a lot of processing that goes on. And uh, I found that in generating synthetic data, it did make a difference. Ah, OK. That is probably important if you need sub-pixel precision. Um, depending on the task, this might not be necessary, of course. But of it's, course, in it's calibration, it's on pedestrian recognition. Yes. Yeah. Great remark. I, um, I'm currently unsure how Blender does this. Maybe this is something we should it probably, we might. probably need to do some post processing to make it work. Probably. Okay, so let's move on because of time reasons, but great remark anyway. Um, how do I do now anything with my scene? For that, we have the entity manipulator. It can basically do anything, but we're going to restrict it on a certain use case to show you what it can do. Here, we use um, uh, the entity manipulator to move our head. This head is called Susan. That is, Blender calls all ape head Susan. That is, because it was the model was called like that ages ago and it's still in Blender just as a gag, I assume. And our goal is now to move it to a random new position. So we have to first select this object and then change the location over our config file. For that, we only need that much of code. So, um, each entity manipulator always has a selector, which you can see here, which selects the objects it should affect. And then down here, some uh, assignment of things you wanna change. So first, let's look at the selector. Uh, is there a question? No? Okay. Um, so the selector here is again a provider. The provider returns something to you. And in this instance, we use the provider called getter entity. It returns some entities. Entity can be anything. It can be a mesh object, camera, a light, anything in that regard, which is actively placed in your scene. Then we can specify some conditions. You can use and conditions like here, or you can use a set of and conditions, which are then combined with or conditions. So you can say, I want either um, all meshes. So you can specify here the type the mesh, so it only returns meshes, which are called, uh, which are named Susan, like this hat. And then you have, can also have a condition which says, or it says, um, that is then done in list structure. You can check out, there's an example for that too, um, how this is, it's more complex conditions are done. And so you have a, uh, a lot of options to select the objects you actually want to have. And then they are internally re returned. And then what you can do is um, set, for example, the location. You can now just provide a new a vector for the location and set it to 000, for example, or you use one of the providers to get a new location. And then you can decipher here with the uniform 3D sampler uh, and min max value, you get then a new location. Quite simple. And um, here we even remove the parameter set to make it even a bit shorter, which is also a possibility. And then we can set here the rotation and Euler coordinates or Euler values, which is not maybe straightforward, but one way to do it. And lastly, we set here some custom properties. Custom properties are um, things we want to save in, uh, in a certain object. So I now want to save in this head that the uh, custom property named physics, which is set to true. So if you want to do that, you just write in front of it, CP underscore physics. And the nice thing is now you can use this custom property later on as a selection criteria. You could ask, oh, please return all objects which have the custom property CP underscore physics set to true. Then you could get them to nice for selection. Um, it can also be used in this instance for physics simulation, what we're going to do next. So we, just to summarize, we first select it. Then we set the location by randomly uh, sampled here a value, and then we set rotation order. The entity manipulator uh, provides one more functionality. If you return more than one well, uh, entity here, you can decipher which mode it uses. There's either a mode which samples all of those values once and uses them for everything, or it samples for each of these entities new values so that all of them are sampled on new locations. Of course, if there is no sampling of the values or for all of them, the same, like for C C CP physics here. So after I already hinted, there is physics simulation here. Let's look how this works. So um, we had this floating head and now we want to throw it down on this 
um, play. Um, nicely, Blender already has the bullet engine integrated, which is a physics simulator, and we can tap in that and use it to simulate our object. So, because floating objects are not that realistic in real life. If it's not just a video where someone throws something in the air, most objects are stationary on some surface. So we try to get this head back down on this plane. And to do this, we just use the physics positioning module. In this instance, um, we, couldn't, we don't need to use any config. There are default values for all um, parameters, but I just randomly picked three here to ch show you which options you would have. If you want to know more, as always, check the class file for physics positioning. At the top, you will see a list of all config values up to date. I promise I take this really seriously, else it's unusable. So we always make sure that all parameters you could specify here are well documented. So here we say we set the simulation time and max simulation time and in which interval of seconds it should be checked. So we say the simulation runs between four and 20 seconds and every second after four, we check if any object is still moving. If not, we stop the simulation. Um, of course, depending on the complexity of your scene and how many objects you have currently moving, the physics simulation might take some time. Even though it's heavily optimized, it still takes some time, depending on the complexity, of course. So and now we're coming back to the question we had earlier about camera sampling. And um, how, do you, how do you do camera sampling? So we had this one camera pose here in the beginning, but what if I want more camera poses? Not just one pose, a variety of them, and at best, a lot of random poses. For that, you could use our camera sampler. In the camera sampler, you specify um, the cam poses, how they are defined. And you can now say, how many samples, how many camera poses do I want to have? And when you say five, for example, then we'll generate five different camera poses. Here you can use then a location for the location of these cameras. This location term is an internal value of a Blender object, which is called location. So if you would be in the code, you could also type object.location and set set that attribute to a certain value. We provide here an API to the outside world where you can then use our provider here and sample a location um, in this range. And then what you can do is use the rotation and we don't try to figure out where to look at because looking in 3D is hard. We just say, oh, we don't specify it in the Euler format, for example. We say look at, which is a function, which is then um, tries to, uh, needs to get a value, a 3D position where it should look at. And for that, we can use a provider which is called point of interest, P-O-I. And in this instance, if we don't provide any parameters, it will just calculate the mean over all objects, and then it will look at the center position of all objects in this instance, at the middle of the scene. And then you can do in-plane rotation, which I didn't cover in this example, but there's a variety of things you can do on top of this to generate different images. Of course, you can make the location sampling more complex. You could use a sphere sampling here, where you set the radius, and then you can specify the position of that uh, sphere to be, again, a provider, where a uniform sample is used, the radius is a value sampler, or you change the radius dynamically between a certain range and so such, such uh, things. So there's a big variety of how to do this camera sampling. Coming back to your question earlier, so of your robot arm, uh, if you would have now loaded your robot arm in your scene, you could use this look at uh, provider combination here to look then at your arm wherever you sampled your camera. And then you should actually see the arm. If you use here a provider, um, getter entity and then extract the location of it, you can um, do that too. Then you could directly look at that certain object if you want to do, do that. Um, did that answer your question from earlier? Yes, Sorry, uh, it was so a bit That answered my uh, situation for the camera position, but yes. I'm still unclear about how do I get the objects into the frame. So here I see there are like few cylinders, few balls and uh, ah, cubes. Okay. So um, for that, you can use the entity manipulator. So um, you first would select the objects and then you can set new locations. 
If you know where to set them, you can just put them directly here. If you don't know that, you can sample them. Does this answer the question? Uh, yes, but uh, let, let's say that object doesn't exist in the Blender's uh, basic library. So it's yeah. something totally new and not even in those data sets such as Sun CG and some mm -hmm. other sets. So how do I get that data from the Blender into this config file? Um, so do you have a blend file of your object? I don't, but I want to know what's the procedure of doing that. So um, then you would have to start open Blender, watch some tutorials, how do I generate a 3D object in Blender? There are great tutorials out there. And um, then actually generate your object okay. in Blender. I don't know what you want to generate. Let's assume uh, um, a globe. So you have your globe, you texture it, and then you build up around this thing which holds the globe. And then you save it as a blend file. Okay. And this blend file can now be loaded with the um, blend loader. In the loader folder, there's a module called blend loader. And this one can load blend files. And then you can extract this globe from this file and load it in your scene. It will have the same name as before. And then you could select it like this and change a location or rotation or the materials if you want. There's also a material manipulator to change certain aspects of material properties, but I'm not going to cover this today. All right. Yeah, I, I think I get the overall idea. How to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. If you have any further questions, please open issues and ask your question. Then we can help you. If we don't know, we can't help. There is a question by Ina. Um, yes. She's asking, can you build video easily? Yes. Um, so, so far, um, what we did is um, we used the camera poses as keyframes. A keyframe in Blender is, um, if you have your camera positions, you would have at the first frame, your camera here, and at the last frame here. And if these are not directly next to each other, meaning that your first frame might be zero and your second frame after 48 images, so two seconds at 24 FPS, then Blender would naturally interpolate between those two positions and would generate automatically a movement uh, between these positions. And you could also save a physics simulation in that regard. You have your physics uh, on, let all the objects fall from their initial positions down, and you could, while doing that, move the camera through space. But I did not cover this because this is a bit more advanced in this initial presentation. But of course, you can do Blender uh, video rendering with Blender. That's cool. Yeah. This answered the question. Okay, where were we? So we're at the camera sampler. And let's talk about generation speed. This is something I get asked all the time. How fast is it to generate my data? Um, for that, let me share first my mantra or our mantra is then a data generation is usually done once. This is so in most computer vision tasks, um, excluding real uh, reinforcement learning for now. Um, you usually generate your data and then you try to optimize your model so that your uh, model performs well on your training, test, and validation set. Um, in the last months, there is a trend where people are generating data on the fly. This is something I wouldn't do with Blender, except if you have a lot of computational power. Um, telling you how long it takes is a bit difficult because, first of all, there are a lot of influential factors here. It depends on the resulting images. How big is our data? Do they have 32 by 32? Quite fast. Do you need 4K images? Then it takes a while. Um, how many objects do you load? Are they big? Do you already load for each camera post? You do 500 megabytes of object data. Then it will take a while to load them in Blender and render your camera poses, even though the rendering is then quite fast, even when the modules are quite complex. I honestly don't know how this works, but it's still amazing, even if you have super detailed models with a lot of vertices in the billions, the rendering time is not that much affected. I don't know why it's, for me, it's like magic, but it's good magic. And lastly, um, if you use physics, the simulation time might be different too. So sometimes the simulation just for this head we just saw is super quick. It takes like a few milliseconds, maybe 100, 200 milliseconds. But if you throw a hundred of these hats on a rough shaped, I don't know, sofa or couch, then this will be bit more complex and will probably need more time. In average, for the use cases we had, we usually calculate with two to five seconds per image. Of course, always depending on the GPU hardware at hand. If you don't have any GPU, 
it's probably more than 50 seconds than two to five. A GPU is crucial to generate realistic um, data. Uh, what we usually say is, if you have a few GPUs at hand, you start a process on Friday, by Monday you have enough data to train all the networks you want for that one particular problem. If you have more GPUs, you can do that in a few hours, of course, too. What is the image resolution? Uh, what you want. You can set that. That's one of the, there's a value called resolution X and yeah. there's a Y and you set it and then it renders in that resolution you need. But the two to five seconds, that benchmark, it ah, doesn't matter. Um, that, was, um, that was standard resolution between 128 and 224 hmm. squared. So these are typical resolutions used in uh, computer vision tasks. If you need more, probably a bit longer. Always depends on the scene. It's super hard to save values here because uh, there's such a big amount of things you can do. What I would suggest, just try that and see if it's fast enough for your um, scenario. And if not, you can raise an issue and ask us if you can do something to improve the rendering time. There are some things you can do. Uh, usually decreasing the sample amount and using the AI denoiser help a lot and such things. So there's a combination of things you can do to improve generation speed. Most of them are by nature activated in Blender. Probably we spend a lot of time optimizing um, how to use Blender because they have some tiny default, so not default, they have tiny buttons in the UI deeply hidden. And if you mm -hmm. turn them on, it's suddenly 20, 30% faster. I'm not completely sure why they're not turned on all the time. I'm pretty sure there is a reason for that, but I don't know that one. So generation speed is a bit hard to um, tell you prior to describing your problem to me. Okay, um, what is the impact of uh, Blender Proc in real applications, in real challenges? and computer vision. So as I said, we had the lucky position that we were the chosen renderer for the BAP challenge in ECCD 2020, and they need massive data to generate these 60 poses. So uh, we evaluated, well, they, I shouldn't say we, they evaluated here on TLS, uh, the TODO data set and YCBV, just for comparison reason. They used the most advanced method, which there is currently in 60 pose estimation, which is called cozy pose. And they showed that instead to rent to this normal used OpenGL method way, they get a giant improvement. So this first version here is just rendering the object and then pasting a random background behind the object. And especially for TLS, which is a textualist data set, that's why it's called like that, um, you get a really poor performance here in comparison then if you use real images or realistic looking images. These are not real, they're rendered with Blender Proc. PBR stands here for physics-based rendering. Then there's also OpenGL version two, where they place random textures on their objects and randomize the background, not just with uh, normal images, also with textures. And then they increase the amount of uh, images by factor of 10 or something. Check the paper for more details. And as you can see, then it gets better, but it's still not even close to the performance you can get um, with PBR. So there's a gap of 20%, which is giant. And if you now have real data at hand, which is in this instance for 60 post estimation, really hard to get, you get even a bit better performance. You can use this real data to get even a bit better performance. You see here's an additional step. Sometimes, but you, uh, sometimes you don't have any real data and then you have to rely on PBR. Of course, our goal is now, how do we get PBR so good that we don't need any real data anymore? That's the goal of Blender Proc, that you can generate so diverse data that for most problems, this is enough. You don't need to annotate any real data. So I was really impressed by these results when I saw them and was like, yes, this proves what we have shown in other works, but in such a broad and nice code because they evaluated this on a, I don't know how many data sets, nine? I'm not completely sure how many data sets Bob has, but there is a big amount of data sets where they tested this on. This is basically a collection of all 60 post data sets and they've showed that PBR in all data sets leads to a big improvement. Even the data sets where you don't even have any texture, like here where 
just better shading model and better realistic looking images uh, perform better. So um, I already mentioned some data sets we support. Here's not complete list of data sets we support. There's SunZG, there's CNET, there's ShapeNet, which I mentioned earlier in the reconstruction talk. Then there are a lot of data sets related to BOP, like TLS, um, LineMod, uh, Homebrewed DB, uh, YCB video, and then there's 3D Front. This is this new data set similar to SunZG and a bunch of other data sets. We're currently in the process of getting our first human shaped data set in there because in the uh, human uh, pose uh, world, they have used a lot of real data and sometimes simulated data, but the simulated data is not that great. It's sometimes even just OpenGL and Blender, for example, supports something called subsurface scattering. Um, when light hits human skin, it enters it a bit and then retracts in a diffuse way. And this entering in and getting out is, cannot be just um, simulated by a normal plane. That's why if you see a human skin in computer games, um, sort of color, um, it just looks flat because of this missing attribute. The same is true for candles. For candles, you have that if you, for example, you look through a light on your finger, you see um, this light going through and this property is missing in such games. And Blender can simulate that. And we hope through that that the skin will be look more natural than before. So this is one of the few things which are coming to Blender Proc in the near future. Next week, we can get this PR from someone out of the Blender Proc community integrated into Blender Proc. And I've already said it a bit, but all of this is open source. And this is such a great valuable thing for us. And of course for you, because you can use it, we get contributions for you and you find errors which you might have overlooked. And if you wanna find more, just check out here this link, um, get started, check some of the examples. If you have any issues, just post them. We're usually really quick in answering your questions and have fun with it. Here are, um, ah, one thing I nearly forgot. Um, it may have seemed so far that this was done solely by me. This is not true. Uh, this was joint work with a lot of colleagues of mine. Um, there's Martin Sonomaya, Dominic Winkelbaum, some uh, dear colleagues of mine who have worked um, on this uh, with me from day one. And then there are students like Dimitri Olivier and Yusuf uh, Sidan, Mohamed Oleg Badrabi, Markus Knawa, Haridan Kajam, and Asan Lodi. Uh, all of those students have helped make Blender Proc the state it is today. And lastly, but not least, uh, Tomasz Hodan. He's a PhD student uh, out um, Prague, who is the organizer of the Bob Challenge and helped us integrate all Bob data sets into uh, Blender Proc with the help of Martin. And all of those people together helped into, uh, integrate all of these great features and I'm really grateful to work with them. Of course, now this list is even not complete because we have now, I think, 23 contributors to Blender Proc from all around the world. And I have not named all of them. I hope they forgive me for this, but out of time reasons, I didn't want to go to the full list. Hopefully, I can count you in one day on contributing to Blender Proc. And if not, I hope at least you enjoyed um, this talk. Here are some references. And do you have any last questions? Quiet. Quiet. Can I ask no you? questions. Yes, I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Uh, so for pinhole cameras, does it uh, support uh, just uh, all the parameters like principal point, the failures, uh, all different distortion models, and so on? Um, all different distortion models? Probably no. But what we do now support is uh, you can set the K-matrix and um, Problem is Blender uses a weird way of representing camera models. It's not a straight way um, most people are known to. And we found a way of uh, getting this K matrix inside of Blender. It's not that great, but for now it works for all the things we tested on and we tested this on collaboration data to see if it actually does what we want. And these things are um, supported, but of course, if there's a, a feature missing, might be your time to shine and implement it into Blender. But we already support k matrix um, So mm -hmm. if you have a calibrated intrinsics of your um, camera, you can use that directly into Blender. Might mm -hmm. not be perfect though. 
And uh, also another question. So, for example, you had uh, images with uh, lamps uh, yeah. that, is, uh, that is light. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, uh, the light uh, direction should be uh, correlated with uh, content of the image. So, should you do it uh, manually or it's done uh, like automatically in, uh, in this um, time in, in Blender? I don't completely understand. Um, let's move to one of the images where you see the yeah, light. Yeah, where you have uh, lamps. Yes, uh, so um, lamps, there are different variety of lamps which Blender supports. Um, there's no, 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 no. Uh, the question is not what it, it supports, but for example, in the room you have, uh, you have light and you have uh, bulbs, you have uh, light. It's yes. uh, depicted in the image, so it should be correlated with the light that is in the scene. Yes. So how you correlate uh, this content of the image together with definition of the lighting? Okay, um, so what, um, what I get from your question, I hope I got, got it right. Um, so what we specify is only the position of the light, the strength, and maybe the color. Um, how the light influences the scene is done by a ray tracer. It calculates the, uh, the so it basically simulates the light falling on all objects and then uh, traces this back to the camera. Is that, does this answer your question? I'm not completely sure if I get it correctly. So can you go to the image where you have these uh, bulbs or lamps? lamps uh, on I think this was... Yes, uh, yes this one. This one. Ah, okay. So uh, it, it doesn't look that uh, ah, illumination yes. comes from the same uh, source of... Uh, so there is some... Uh, True. Um, okay. for, for this, this is Sanzi And Sanzi has lamps, as you can see in this one image. It does not have lamps in all rooms. So we cheat a bit here by also making all windows mid-light, as you can see here in this image. This side of the wall is darker than this one because the window does not shed any light here. And additionally, each of the ceilings have some light too. So they emit some light that the scene is not dark because if there are even rooms which don't have any lamps or windows. I do not know why, but it is like that. And the amount of lamps in the data set is not that high. Human scenes usually have much more lamps than these scenes. I think it's an architectural oversight as we use this data set. And in the beginning, we only used the lamps and the windows. And then we realized like 20% of the images are just dark. Mm -hmm. you know, we had to trick and emit the light from the ceiling. But if you have a better uh, representation of your indoor scenes, if you know, oh, there are always lamps, then the light would only come from them. If we remember here in the beginning of this uh, talk, when we saw this image here, there you can see that these lamps actually emit some light. It's brighter around the lamp. It's not that much, but it's a bit. And here on the floor, you see the shadow of a window mm -hmm. or the light spot of a window, not the shadow, sorry. So depending on this uh, scene, of course, um, you will have these things. There is a true light simulation. Sometimes for Sanzi G, at least we had to cheat because of the missing lamps in the um, scenes, but nice catch. Mm -hmm. uh, I also have questions regarding the first part, but I am afraid that you are tired already. Can I ask still? Uh, is it okay? Hey, Emma, maybe let's give someone else the opportunity to ask, and if we don't have time, we ask, get back to you. Else you can always write me an email or open an issue at Blender Proc, okay? Promise. Anyone? Also, I will add to this, um, there's going to be a post on Reddit for Q&A. If anybody has a question he thinks about after this talk, you can post it there. And then everybody also has access, so, you know. Um, yeah. well, we don't want to make anything secret here. Yeah. <laughs> um, Chance for anyone else? If not, we're going to go back to Ina, if I let yeah. her. Uh, so... Uh... I wanted to ask it uh, from the start, but my microphone didn't work. So what I don't understand is exactly, so for example, you have a box that is front or parallel to camera, and so you see square in the image. And so it's not clear to me how you can uh, uh, reconstruct 3D uh, box from, from its impulse problem. And yes, it, yes. absolutely. Uh, Okay, and uh, 
so, so it's still it's your post problem. So it will uh, predict some average from what the camera has seen in these cases. Okay, I understand. And then another question is uh, usually in in robotic application like yours, uh, it's video. You have a lot of images, so you should uh, understand how to navigate. But you shouldn't do it all the time. It's, and for uh, like large, uh, uh, for example, when you make 3D construction, you you just rotate the image a lot. But in uh, in real life, you don't need uh, for navigation problem. You don't need to rotate so much. And then the question is how do you combine it? How do you do the same one for video? Because now the camera changes its position and you build. Uh, in camera, you don't build uh, this 3D volume, I don't know how to say it, 3D volume representation in world, it's in camera. So how would you combine everything together? So if you ah. could I, I, What I got is um, how do I combine more than one image? Because, yeah, something yeah. like this one, because you, uh, you don't need uh, really, uh, so it's, it's more real problem when you have a few images and like video and you want uh, to build this 3D representation. And so exactly. how do you combine, yeah. So um, this first work we did was solely on, we have one image and how do we get to 3D? I'm currently already working on, first I wanna integrate semantic segmentation because I feel like that will help. And after that, I wanna look at how do I integrate several camera views? Of course, then we have the problem, how do I uh, combine those? Um, do I first have to um, estimate a camera pose so that I can align them? Do I maybe not to do, need to do that because I can learn this combination step? And there are a lot of questions because um, as I said, there's basically nearly no research from color to uh, 3D scenes. And so there is even less research on multiple image to 3D scenes in such regard. Of course, there is a works where you have a bunch of images and you try to reconstruct the scene. Um, but they usually work more on finding first correspondences between the images and then do um, normal depth estimation, stereo depth estimation and predict the points. No, but not exactly, because we also have this uh, idea with, um, if you have had about multiple images, so the idea is the same one, but you have like from the, the single image, you can build this uh, MPI representation where you just uh, consider uh, what happens in specific depth. It's like uh, plain uh, oh. PSV method, something like this one. So there is some, uh, it's not similarity, but uh, they also use this frustrum, uh, they build this frustrum, they build it differently. So they have plain, uh, it was set in uh, depth, and then uh, in this plane, they, for each pixel, we have RGB alpha, so four uh, numbers. Here is, uh, there is, it's not the same, but you also have this idea of splitting by depth value. And uh, it's... Uh, of course, okay. this work is not completely on its own in the uh, mm -hmm. big world of research. Um, if I got it correctly, they try to more predict the step slice in color, but we try to predict uh, more oc occupancy. And um, you, of course, you can then try to transfer this to occupancy, but it's not directly the same. And no, color is always just a projection, where occupancy is the actual value at that point in space. No, no, we don't have only RGB. We have RGB and alpha, and the alpha is like ah, uh, transparency, but it's like occupancy in a way. Yeah, it's just the same. Um, then it's quite similar, just that we don't do RGB prediction because RGB prediction is nice for visualization. Oh, look how here I generate an object from the backside and it looks also nice, but in a robotic sense, at least I am not can think about a use case where I need to know the color of the object on the other side. Uh -huh. okay. at, at least I can't, maybe there is an application for this. I don't want to say that. Mm -hmm. But output is uh, like uh, it's soft. It's between zero and one. So uh, I no, I am not. But you, you this don't... is this is the same here. So um, there is no probability here. But we yeah. still have this uh, uh... floating surface. Mm -hmm. And if you only have zero to one, you have this binary voxel decision problem you had earlier that I described earlier, where you, if you example, move your uh, output by one pixel, you have a giant loss at the boundary. 
-hmm. And if you have TSTF volumes, if you move them, all the values just shift one bit. Mm -hmm. But I think we're getting a bit too much in detail here. And okay. um, if you have any more questions, post them on Reddit or mm -hmm. get other way in contact with me and then we can discuss them there, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Very interesting. Anybody else, any questions? Uh, we are wrapping up here. Hi, um, I don't know if you can hear me. I have one question. Yeah. Uh, you were talking earlier about the sim to wheel gap and mentioning that it's not about extreme realism and more about uh, expanding the simulation domain. Yes. Um, I was wondering if there were any testing about that. Yes. Um, maybe the results, the, 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 um, the success rate. Yeah, exactly. Um, Could be higher with uh, pushing the realism a bit forward. Um, okay, realism might be, we, we couldn't do any more real than PBR for now. Um, uh, what they did in Cozy Post, this winner of the Bob Challenge, the approach which produced these values, um, they generated on top of the images we provided, these 300,000 images we rendered, um, they generated a million image per data set and they randomized them hardcore, like completely over the board where you're like, this is not real anymore, but it helped to generalize. Why is probably a nice point for further research where you would say, okay, this is probably uh, because of that or because of that. But for now we learned a bigger uh, simulation domain helps the generalization and it is something um, we expected beforehand, but this results proved it and it proved it really great. It was an employment boost of 30% or something in the tests. For that, I would refer to the Bob Challenge and the Cozy Post paper. To That's another reference. I'll ask the link for after the call. I would love to, to have more conversations on this topic though. Uh, so if anyone wants to reach out and say I hello. was, I was um, actually, I, I have a bit of experience with that. I'm developing my own synthetic data set using Blender. I'm, I'm a Blender artist and developer. And what I was trying to do with my data set is pushing the realism with, ex with advanced PBR, advanced texturing and lighting oh, okay. within Blender. And I, I found that results do change with that. So it's not only the, the um, expanding the domain, which is obviously the, 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 the first thing that you should do, mm -hmm. but. but I found that the realism does, does tweak the results. How, how you tried testing on that? The problem is it's really hard to tell what is still real and what is not. So of course you could now figure out for these objects here, we see from TLS, the exact reflectance of this shiny surface here, and then pinpoint that and use that for the generation. Or we just give a broad range and use that. And some would now argue, especially on based on the results I've seen on Cozy Post, that, uh, that a broader domain helps more than just this one particular perfect value. Uh, can I ask on which um, challenge you work, on which task is to supply this data set? Um, it wasn't a challenge. It's, it's uh, uh, my own project and devel developing for different clients. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, something more that I'm working on. No, just a problem like semantic segmentation, 60 post estimation, normal estimation, just so that I know more. Um, it's a lot of object detection uh, okay. on a macro level. So um, if uh, I, I, getting down to the scratch level. Of, oh, I see. Okay, yeah. so um, of course there are always certain things which are particularly important for certain domains. And in 60 post estimation, it showed that a giant simulation um, domain helps. In other domains, this might not be so true. But we will see what future results. I think we're just at the beginning of exploring what PBR can do for us in deep learning. Of course, there have been some results in the past and they've only showed, oh, if you do it, it improves it. But deciphering exactly which parts are responsible for what will need a lot of more research. And sadly, this is really, really computational intensive because first you need to generate the data and then you need to train different models to see what is the effect it had? I mean, in, in, intuitively, it would make sense that the closer the, you know, the higher the fidelity of the imagery, the closer it is to real imagery, 
then the less the range of variation you would need in each dimension, in each mode. Just intuitively. Intuitively. Um, but, that might be true, but remember that if you train on uh, training data, which is really close to the test data, because it's the same domain if you use realistic images, um, you still have this gap. So, I'm, because then you would assume that the approach just works 100%. I mean, the, 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 the bigger problem, I think, goes back to understanding the application. Like, what are you actually trying to get yes. your robot or your autonomous system to do? How do you specify the requirements for that? And then how do you tie those requirements back to kind of real world physical conditions, lighting conditions, weather conditions, atmospheric obscurance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and write a reasonable requirement specification stating what your system does. And that I think is the interesting thing. And, and actually I think this is not the forum for it, but I'd love to talk to either or both of you offline after uh, to continue because I've got some a couple of things that I'm doing, which I think you might find interesting. It's a good time to mention, I posted the link to the Discord group channel. Everybody's there, so, you know, and you can personally interact also with everybody there. Okay. Um, so whoever wants to continue the chats here, um, feel free. Maybe other people also use Blender and Blender Proc. Ah, oh, oh um, I do. sorry, Peter, for interrupting. Go ahead. Um, Martin a colleague of mine who works really closely on this with me, uh, just said um, the realism of the PBR images has been very crucial. And he has worked a lot um, with the experts from Cozy Post together to produce his final results. And the results on the table had the same strong augmentations and realistic images were still much better. Ah, oh, I didn't know that. And um, so you see strong augmentations are crucial, but on PBR, they improve the results even more. Thank you so much for this comment, Martin. So PBR has shown that it improves the results. Of course, it takes a little bit more time in generating the data, but I hope with Blender Proc we can reduce the time you need to set up everything so that in the end you save some time. And if more people use it and write more modules, it gets even easier. Isn't that nice? Isn't that the best part about it? <laughs> By the way, I think uh, differently. I think that uh, if simulation is uh, contains reality, it's even better because there are so many parameters in neural networks that uh, the number of data is not uh, uh, will never be enough. And uh, uh, broadening the data, even if it's not exactly as in reality, will uh, somehow uh, somehow robustify the, the networks. So uh, intuition may be not exactly wrong, but simulation should be equal to reality. Simulation should include reality yes. and, and be larger than reality itself. That is what I hope to show with this one image here. Of course, it's a super uh, broad representation, but how do I encapsulate reality with simulation? I think that was a really nice closing statement because we're so much over time. Exactly, exactly what I was about to say. Um, Max, this was a really, really interesting talk. Um, I think there's a lot more for me to learn for sure. And for the audience more to go in depth in these, in these things, um, 3d reconstruction is growing the past years. And, uh, what you mentioned doing scene 3d reconstruction, not just one object. This is a, this is a challenging task. Um, thank you for the talk. Thank you for the time. This is, uh, I think we're almost three hours, right? Almost three hours in total. Amazing. I wasn't expecting this. We, we, we planned on two hours, just anybody know. And still there's 12 people still in the audience. We maxed out, by the way, in 40 people. Somewhere in the 40 minutes. For so long but, and listening to me. I really yeah, this, this, this is a good indication that this talk was good, actually. So really, <laughs> thank you again. Um, I posted again, I posted the links to where you can find the community and all the information and people are exchanging ideas and the discord and the reddit. So really uh, feel free to join in and talk. I liked it when the talks are that because I can see it even if I don't respond me personally, I like to see the to see the information there and I'm sure other people do. So that's um, it's a good place to communicate more. Um, the next uh, lecture will be I think in about two weeks about continual learning. Um, from uh, Davida Betty from uh, Qualcomm. And again, thank you everybody for participating and, and, and asking the questions and commenting and, uh, and you know, um, helping this happen more and more. Um,
And in this, in this, uh, with these words, I think I'm going to close and I will say bye. Thank bye you. From my side too. That was really useful. Thank you. You're welcome. It was fun to give it. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. bye.